welcome. In this episode of Real Talk, you'll hear a bit of this. For me, TV is not just just one thing. There's a really great quote, actually, that Tess Alps, who used to run Thinkbox, uh, said. She said it about nine or ten years ago. She said, TV isn't dead, it's just having babies. And a bit of that. If TV didn't exist, how big would Twitter be? And, and the answer was not, not nearly as big. So today's guest started his career at the Manchester Evening News and went on to spend much of his career at media agencies. He's now ITV's Business Development Director and has been for the past 12 years. It's Jason Spencer. Thank you for having me. How are you, Jason? I'm very well. I'm looking forward to this. I'm slightly daunted by the fact there's four of you and one of me, but we'll see how it goes. We like to keep our guests outnumbered, don't we? <laughs> yeah. um, so also joining us are Ben and Lizzie from IMA Media Team. They are our resident experts. They're going to be grilling Jason on uh, everything he's going to talk about. They're armed with big opinions, thought-provoking stats, uh, so do be prepared. So, Jason, can you tell us what you're joining us today to call BS on? I'm going to be calling BS on the death of linear broadcast television. <sighs> wow. Can you give us a bit of background on this? Why exactly is there so much scaremongering on this topic of linear TV and the death of it? Well, I think it's ultimately a lot of lazy, inaccurate messaging that gets out there rather than being based on reality. So uh, if you look at 2024 so far, uh, who out of uh, anyone here in this room or even your listeners hasn't watched at least one of Traitors, Gladiators, Luke Littler at the Darts or Mr Bates versus the Post Office, all of which are massive on linear broadcast TV. So... I think there's loads of evidence out there to show that it simply isn't dying. One of the issues with linear TV at the moment is the fact that, yes, big appointment TV moments are drawing big audiences in, but if you want to reach a big audience continually and achieve frequency, you can't necessarily do that with just linear TV on your schedule. I think it's a fair point. I mean, listen, TV viewing has changed immeasurably over the last few years. Just think about our own viewing habits in terms of how we watch content and great, great programming. Um, so with all of that change, you've got to think a little bit more broadly. I, th I think actually a good starting point is, is what is TV in 2024? How do you define it? Hmm. I'm, I'm, are you, you tell us. Well, I don't know. Oh, well. well, I suppose I suppose it'd be interesting. I mean, listen, language is everything, and it'd be really interesting to get your your view as well on this. But but for me, TV is not just just one thing. Um, and th there's a really great quote actually that Tess Alps, who used to run Thinkbox, uh, said. She said it about nine or ten years ago. She said, "TV isn't dead; it's just having babies." And the whole idea is that TV isn't just one thing. So if you define TV in 2024, I think you've almost got to make this distinction between linear broadcast TV and streaming TV. They're very, very different beasts, very different viewing occasions, mm. and you've got to think about how they work together. I think it's important to consider YouTube as well. So it makes up 8.1% of all viewing on the big screen. And I think for the viewer, they're seeing kind of advertising across the big screen all under one umbrella. So for planners, it's important to consider kind of CTV, BVOD, SVOD TV all together. Absolutely. I think the ecosystem in which someone like ITV operates in now is totally different to 10 years ago. So our competition's changed. Uh, when we're talking to agencies and advertisers, we have to be more sensitive to the fact that it isn't just an ITV Channel 4 Sky World. It's much more multifaceted youtube netflix amazon there's a multi you know multiple amount of choices for you these days mm. yeah and what's your view with the younger audience then because when it comes to weekly reach we see that declining overall for all adults for broadcast tv dipping under 70 uh, 80 percent recently in in the last year for 16 to 34 s it's down to about 64 percent reach and it's declining rapidly i know there's an argument that bvod and svod make up much of the difference but it does make you wonder you know how you should think about tv how important is it especially for those especially for those younger audiences i think it's a really good point listen we're not in denial the fact that younger audiences are accelerating the change in their viewing behavior versus older adults and listen as they go through the various life stages none of us know whether those behaviors will change as they have children settle down etc um so I, th I think i'd probably point out a couple of things here one is 60% plus reach is still a massive number. It's mm -hmm. still the majority of people across the country and TV still has a formative role within that media plan. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, it's not planned in isolation. 
So if you look at the viewing for some of our programming that particularly attracts younger audiences, we would never really be recommending that you look at linear broadcast TV on its own. In fact, how we schedule some of our shows runs concurrently across linear and uh, streaming. But when it comes to media brands in particular, I think I've, I've read something recently which is really interesting is that when it comes to 16, 34 year olds in terms of reach by brand all the top five are all social media brands where it's over 55s, ITV's top and then and Channel 4 and then I think Facebook and, and on. You know, I think that's really just really interesting in terms of what the future looks like for media brands and the ITV brand in with that audience. Yeah, I, listen I, again, I, I'm not here to you know this is this is this series is all about calling bs on things so so we're here with facts you know on your side mm. and, and and what i'm talking about too i think what you've got to think about when you talk about media brands is both the viewing total video viewing across those platforms mm. but also the advertising opportunity for brands not everything that you can get through all of those platforms is necessarily with advertising served you've also got to think about the the context and the environment in which mm. your brand sits so i think one of the things that tv whether it's linear broadcast or streaming uh, through uh, someone like itv has really focused on is a, a high quality trusted brand safe environment for brands i think what you are now being offered whether it be through the likes of x or Facebook doesn't necessarily have that high watermark mm. in terms of what it can offer. And that quality content that sits in there in a long form way is still something that has a hugely important role in 2024. One of the things we were talking about is it's interesting, isn't it? In days gone by, you ITV might have been a destination for the viewer because for exactly that point. Whereas now you've almost got brand loyalty to programming. So I'm yeah. a Love Island watcher or I'm going to watch Netflix tonight. A bit yeah. like I'm going to get a delivery. It's really non-prescriptive. And I find that really interesting. So where do you think the brand role sits? I think it's a, re it's a really interesting point. So, so um, interestingly, since we launched ITVX, we've seen, um, and this was our ambition, we've made it a destination for discovery. So sometimes you'll go there without necessarily knowing exactly what you're going to watch. And you'll find content there. Sometimes you are going there for content you know, uh, as, as a kind of very uh, mission-focused way of doing things, so I, I think I think it's a it's a balancing act. I think part of it then comes down to our investment in brand advertising. Uh, so we have always advertised our programs a lot on our own channels, but that's kind of preaching to the converted. Mm -hmm. What we've tried to double down on over the last eighteen months is advertising to people who are not. Uh, uh, sort of heavy TV viewers and it's all about the content you've yeah. got to invest in the content you've talked about things like say Love Island we're investing in a lot more acquisitions now from like the likes of HBO a big film portfolio we're finding that's working really well at bringing in younger audiences because it's free to air so it's a balance overall that's actually something that Nikki and I were talking about last night um, because obviously if you have a platform like ITVX you've got to populate it with great content. And if you're looking for those light TV viewers, it's often the younger audiences that you're trying to attract in, I would imagine, uh, with your marketing yeah. investment. So we just wondered, given the fact that you are gonna have to have so much more content and keep creating more and more content to, to keep those audiences engaged, how does that work with your business model? Because obviously the other thing that you have that's, um, I suppose, a, a unique selling point versus your streaming platforms like Netflix is you're free. Mm. So where is that tipping point between the freeness and quality that you offer and the just the extra content that you're gonna have to keep creating to keep people on these platforms? It's that's quite, quite a big question. Let me let me just t take it <laughs> back, about it back that. a second. No, 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 no. It's <laughs> good. Let me just. Um, <laughs> it's good. It's a good question. It's a good question. So, um, for our business model overall, let's think about where we invest. We're investing over a billion pounds in content on ITV for the linear broadcast side. We're investing 160 million pounds in content. That's commissions and acquisitions on ITVX. A lot of what goes on ITVX will also come onto ITV and. What we have on ITV will go on to ITVX. So there's a kind of two work hand in hand. Um, there is a real thirst for content. Um, and the first year of ITVX, we've learned a lot. We've learned, you know, we've tested things in terms of do people watch on different occasions. The reality is most people watch at the time on ITVX, the times they would have watched on linear. That's interesting. In the evening and at weekends, that's where the spikes are. Interestingly, people watch the soaps on ITVX at the time they would have watched it on linear. Yeah. So people mm. have these mm. these kind of habits. 
Um, we are seeing some new behaviours coming through as well. And just to give you a sense of, you talked about the, the model, how, how, mm. how robust is the model? Well, listen, we are free, but we also have a paid version, ITVX Premium. The free version basically is founded on the fact that you can access all this amazing content free in exchange for watching a small number of adverts. And those adverts are targeted because everything we have on ITVX now is addressable from an advertising point of view. Um, and to put some numbers on it, we've got 40 million registered users with all the first party data on ITVX. And we've got about a million people who pay for ITVX Premium, which is the ad free version where you can download some content from it. So 40 million investment. Most people are happy to watch content with some targeted ads in the breaks. And I guess that brings us around to the I guess the opportunity for advertisers generally then. So obviously the fragmentation of media is challenging from a media planning perspective potentially. What about from an, an advertiser's creative perspective? There must be some advantages in terms of pointier targeting, for example, and a real understanding of who, who the audiences are. What what trends yeah. have you seen from an advertiser's perspective? Well, I mean, within ITVX, um, we have, uh, as I say, we've got first party data in a sort of data privacy, data compliant way uh, for uh, everyone on there. And every every single advert that's placed on there uses addressability. We've got about 10,000 different ways in which you can target on there through Planet VR self-serve platform. You can append your own data, look at data match, etc. So those ways of targeting near the bottom of the funnel is, is everything about the role of ITVX. However, you know, alongside that, it's also driving incremental reach and whether it be so through C-Flight or your own uh, sort of proprietary tools, you can see the incremental reach, particularly for younger audiences, that that balance between linear and VOD has on the plans and you can kind of scenario plan that with, with increasing efficient, uh, increasing focus. Yeah. Just from kind of an agency perspective, to plan and buy a linear TV campaign, you do kind of need a team of specialists for yeah. that. And then when you're looking at VOD, I think anyone, well, the terminology is much more digital focused. Anyone who's got a digital background can buy that. Yep. As you say, they're kind of coming in hand in hand and like the campaigns need to have linear and VOD nowadays to get the reach. Do you think there's a future where it's kind of easier to buy a campaign across both of them in this at the same time on the same platform? Absolutely. I, I think, right, so think about where we are at the moment. We've got on IT, on Planet V, you can go into Planet V and you can buy, at the moment, ITVX. We have piloting Sky within there. You've got STV. Mm. Um, obviously, Channel 4 isn't within there at the moment. There are other things that we do, you know, together from a data point of view. But you move forward to a point where everything is, is delivered through IP, which is going to be, within the next probably seven to eight years, seven to eight years or so, everything will be delivered through there. So, at the moment, most of our advertising revenue and most of our inventory is delivered through Planet V. We have a concierge service to, to help where people need some more hand holding on that. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to be frictionless. We're trying to make it really easy in the same way that any advertiser will buy Facebook or YouTube. We want to make that something where we democratize all of the data, all of the opportunities. Uh, for agencies and advertisers. Yeah, I think whilst we can't, you know, deny that there is a decline in reach in broadcast TV, what we what we can't deny is the actually the power of the big screen. Yeah. And also I think for for me from an advertising and media planning perspective, I'm really pleased that all of these emerging platforms are you know, mainly viewed on the big screen. So again that whilst we get that extra layer of targeting and addressability and you know because frankly the the kind of the broader targeting sort of audience demographics that you buy on TV are just massive and not really suitable for every advertiser they work for some so i love it that we've got more vod and we can get much much more targeted but i love it that we're not losing the big screen attention impact fame I agree I agree I, th I think it's it's about you know for want of a better phrase, best of both worlds. Mm. You know, so in other words, the ability near the top of the funnel to drive mass reach, to know that people are watching that together, the s signaling strength that that tells you about a brand, mm. the fact that your brand, you know, your your advert is seen by lots of people simultaneously. 
combined with what you can do near the bottom of the funnel with addressability. So I'm really interested in the whole kind of consumer behaviour part of this and we were talking about it earlier so almost the idea that you need to be in a certain place at a given time yeah. is is old fashioned these days both in terms of meeting people in the pub at 8 o'clock because you said you would or sitting down for Coronation Street at 8 o'clock because that's when you yeah. need to start watching it um, and we were talking about traitors and the fact that actually um, you needed to watch that live. And I think that's really interesting. So is there potentially the opportunity for linear TV to almost reverse some of the behaviours we're seeing in terms of um, you know, ex- view when you want to, binge watching? Yeah. Is there a trend towards more of the traitor type viewing which gets people back in a room at a given time with that kind of community vibe that that creates? TV is ultimately an art, not a science. All right? so, so whilst we can post-rationalise the success of a... Uh, a Mr. Bates versus the post office, uh, a traitors, etc. You know, you kind of stumble across it and then it creates its own momentum. What we're all trying to invest in is those big event TV moments, those moments when people come together. Live sport has it. You ain't going to watch it any other time than when it's on. It's challenging in certain genres where you've got either a voting mechanism or something that's much talked about, whether it be a Love Island or a traitors, absolutely. I think the interesting is things like drama. So, so, so the question we've been asked quite a lot year to date is whether a drama like Mr. Bates versus the Post Office would have had the same impact if it had run on a streaming platform, if we just run yeah. it on ITVX. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the fact that so many people saw it at the same time created its own momentum and that yeah. had a snowball effect, which then streaming and the catch up potential of it helped build and accelerate. So I think any genre can do it. I just think that sports and those kind of voting live entertainment shows are probably best place to do it. And that's why, certainly for sport, why the, the cost of sports rights is going up. A lot. I guess that's what I was asking. And maybe it's like an old fashioned um, ambition, but there's something really nice about the fact that people did sit down and watch it at the same time. Absolutely. I, I think we have, to, we have to be mindful though, not to be too nostalgic. Yeah. I, th- I think, you know, the biggest, <laughs> show, the biggest, show, the biggest <laughs> show last year was Happy Valley. The biggest show year to date is Mr. Bates versus the Post Office. They're both dramas. Mm -hmm. And the success started on linear, but it was then built momentum through streaming platforms. So it is that mixed ecosystem, which will continue to be key. Going back to our theme for today, you know, TV is not going anywhere. It's going everywhere. Um, As I think my boss once, uh, once said, and I think the success of it is that balance between big tentpole moments combined with the ability to create a lifetime after it as well. It's interesting what you were saying about ecosystem there because I think part of the success of some of these big TV moments is actually um, also to do with the fact that the community that builds around it is on social so yeah. lots of lots of these sporting moments or you know when something really amazing is happening in traitors etc your instant reaction is I want to get on X and see what everyone's saying at the same time as watching and just joining in the conversation is part of the viewing experience now so it's almost like TV and social working hand in hand I was just interested to know uh, because that is just behaviour now are you looking to build bigger links with the the platforms like X, Meta, YouTube etc to to sort of work that more I think with X there's always been a strong link between Twitter as was and and TV and actually uh, there was a study we did a few years ago which which kind of stripped out if TV didn't exist how big would Twitter be and and the answer was not not nearly as big Mm -hmm. Um, I think there are some challenges at the moment that 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 uh, X has in terms of that kind of trust and the content that sits around it but undoubtedly the two work hand in hand so in terms of deeper links yes absolutely we continually explore it as we do with any potential um, partners but there is also the sovereignty of where our content sits us wanting people to view that in mm-hmm. its long form but recognizing like we have with our fast channels etc that there are ways in which people might want to see snippets and bite-sized content around it as well and just going back a bit in the conversation when we were talking about the different ways that advertisers can reach the audience now obviously we know with the young audience that they are inherently ad avoiders um i've done research with my two children of a pool of two um and you know they aren't interested really in advertising i've asked them you know where do you actually find out about brands and um often the answer is tiktok um so 
you know, is that ads on TikTok? It tends not to be. It tends to be recommendations from influencers that they follow, celebrities, that kind of thing. So I just wondered your thoughts on on that, given that they're not natively looking to linear TV, streaming TV even, to find out about brands. Yeah, I, I think, listen, I think it's quite an interesting point um, if you think about the media consumption of uh, whether it be teenagers or or sort of young adults in their 20s. It's un- inherently different to ours and also when we were that age. But from a signalling point of view, young adults are less cynical about advertising than older adults because they haven't received as many ads. Yeah. And this is research that's been done over the last couple of years by House 51 uh, and uh, uh, I think it's also Thinkbox as well. It's uh, been run. And I would say that the success of any brand is to find ways to engage young adults mm. because they're going to be, from a lifetime value point of view, disproportionately important. I'd be um, interested to get your take on Prime Video, where younger viewers are kind of less interested in watching adverts and engaging with brands. So they're bringing out a um, ad platform that's a little bit different from Netflix and Disney with two minutes of advertising an hour. And they've obviously got huge, huge budgets to make shows. So I think the Rings of Power cost over £700 million to make the programme only eight episodes. Mm. So with their adverts sitting only kind of two minutes per hour, it's not as intrusive to the viewer, especially for a younger audience. Amazon as a business are phenomenal. I think you chat to any brand in any category and generally Amazon will be uh, shown as being one of the competitors, either directly or indirectly. And I think for any media owner, the idea of how you can uh, either work with Amazon or manage the competition of Amazon is a challenge. Um, I think there's a couple of things here to say. Um, It's as difficult for an AVOD, so advertising-led platform like ITV, to get into subscription, like ITVX Premium, as it is for a subscription business like Amazon or Netflix to get into advertising. It's not easy, it doesn't happen overnight. I think equally, the economics have got to add up. You know, we're a, a PLC and therefore we have to turn a profit. Most of the SVODs are not making a profit. Amazon's is kind of protected by the overall business. So going back to calling bullshit on linear TV then, it, it, arguably is it the likes of Amazon Prime and Netflix who ideally would call um, the death of um, linear TV to their, their benefit, I guess? Do they need linear TV to do one for them to, to make the money that they're trying to make? Uh, them, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Snap. Mm. Who are in that net? You know, where, where does the list end? I, I, I would say people have been talking about the death of linear TV for 10, 20 years. Uh, and yes, some of the numbers aren't quite a, as big as they were 10, 20 years ago. But you are seeing massive numbers. You'll see, take Rugby World Cup last year, 30 million people watched it. 20 million people watched the Women's World Cup as it became much more mainstream. And we've got the Euros this year. So linear TV is robust it's strong i think none of us should rest in our laurels you know the success of a traitors a gladiators a mr bates versus the post office doesn't mean everything is rosy but what it does mean is that we have the confidence to think about how we can build on that and uh i think the joy is out on streaming platforms it's interesting that all of those um platforms as well actually invest a lot in advertising on linear TV, which is uh, quite ironic. So obviously it works to a degree. With the launch of ITVX obviously doing so well in the first year, do you kind of see all of the eggs going into that basket? Good question. I mean, we've learned a lot over the first year. Um, Not everything you do works. That's just the nature of stuff. Obviously on this podcast, I will only talk about the things that did work, (laughs) uh, just to be crystal clear. Um, I think what I'd say is, so again, let's look at the evidence. We're spending over a billion pounds on content for ITV. We're spending 160 million pounds on content for ITVX. So we're certainly not putting all eggs mm-hmm. in one basket. But would you see that as kind of managing the decline of linear or trying to kind of boost it up? Um, we look at total overall viewing, all right? So so whilst there'd be a difference between them, and you will undoubtedly look at that, we look at are we growing ITVX sufficiently to manage the change in viewing that we're seeing on, on, on ITV? Um, and I think... You know, we are highly scrutinised, you know, as, as a PLC on the growth we're driving on ITVX as part of our strategy to, to grow our digital revenues. Um, 
I think we're always going to kind of keep that in balance where we're going to keep checking have we got that balance right um, and there is nothing to tell us at the moment that we should be changing that balance between the level of investment the level of focus we have on linear versus streaming i think one of the um just leading back to the disconnect between um linear tv and bvard and how we can kind of plan together work together um i think for performance it's difficult from a bvard perspective because with linear we have instant kind of results from a tv squared analyzer but with vard we can only really see impression delivery and un- unless we run an econometric study, we can't really see how that campaign has performed. I, I think, listen, that has been a challenge. Um, but what we've been trying to do is really double down on outcomes because we recognise that bridging the gap between TV and the impact it has is disproportionately important. We've, we've spent about four and a half, five million pounds on outcomes research and tools. So the good old regional test that, that TV and ITV has been synonymous with, we've now uh, launched a, a GOX product which enables you to look at test versus control. We've also launched a kind of addressable lift product which looks at IP matching so you can look at the impact of the investment in linear and VOD and the outcome it has on business. So I think effectiveness is really, really important for us. We need to get that right. Yeah. Do you think that's more kind of from a brand perspective? Um, a lot of brands kind of are more focused on direct response and that's obviously something which TV is great for, linear TV. So with BVOD obviously you can see kind of brand awareness and mm. things increase but do you think it's useful for direct response as well? It's a, it's a really good question because it's it's all very well us saying look look at the medium to long term effect of advertising but most advertisers want to see the short term impact. So the two things we've tried to do is from a linear point of view, we invested in a huge piece of work with Viewers Logic, which we called the hidden value of peak, where we looked at daytime versus peak advertising and showed the short, medium and long term impact on site traffic. So mm-hmm. we can demonstrate that. The second thing we've done is through our data match product is work with brands from an attribution point of view to look at the direct impact of talking to either your own customers, lapsed customers or lookalikes so that you can then attribute that in the short term to look at the ROI. Yeah, I think I think it's kind of a, a broader challenge for the industry, I think, when you look at linear tracking. So you're talking about measuring through Adelizer, matching the spots mm. to a response or a site visit. Whereas generally in the world, the digital world without cookies and so on, it's going to become very hard to track from a linear or at direct attribution perspective anyway. So we need modeling to unpick that and we need econometrics so it's all very well and good like a a sky or an itv in their own world can give you an uplift study and so on what we need as an agency is to understand the total effectiveness of all tv all vod and we need to use econometric modeling to sort of unpick that but the good news for you guys uh both from a vod and a a tv perspective is that we've started to see you know we always over the years tv performs well in econometrics it tends to you'll get the digital guys saying some sort of big conspiracy for tv against (laughs) all the other things but there's reasons why but then what we've seen more recently is that vod is also being picked out of econometrics and you can separate it and it's actually effective and it gives and you can also see that there's much more headroom to spend yeah. more than what we are there as well. So I think there's a huge issue because when we're looking at linear tracking, we're only looking at a tiny amount of what's going on. You need modeling to understand the bigger, uh, the broader view of what's happening. Definitely, and I think that's one of the good things about um, planning at IMO as well, is that we're not limited to what we can do based on kind of a five minute window or there is more yeah. trust and faith in the, the longer term mm. um, like benefits of a campaign and so we often go into presentations talk to clients say look we we can't just be single-minded by with one channel in mind we need to have a balanced plan and the reason for that is the more channels you have the greater sort of trust that's driven the, the greater effectiveness but then when you look at the halo effects tv uplifts pretty much everything else every other channel that's live whereas outdoor might uplift a couple and and so on so i think tv's I think the strongest point after all said and done really is the ability to drive kind of business outcomes for clients and sales and growth in that area. Okay, so whether you're a broadcast TV fan or a streaming addict, it does seem that linear TV is definitely here to stay. So you've convinced us, Jason. Um, Streaming obviously has clear advantages in its distinct targeting capabilities, but 
as you've mentioned several times, uh, Mr Bates versus the post office is really a powerful reminder to us all that TV can make these massive um, impacts and cultural change. Thank you, Jason, for joining us today. I think it's been a really interesting debate. Thank you also to Ben and Lizzie being our resident experts. Thanks for having us. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time on Real Talk.